Good morning everyone. My name is Michelle and I hope you're doing well. It's somewhat overcast in Northern England this morning, but this is still a beautiful setting and I'm out for my morning stroll. And this seems like an unlikely setting for such a horrific story that I'm gonna tell you, but I'm gonna do it anyway. And uh, I've been fascinated by family annihilators for a long time. You know, I've somewhat obsessed over the Chris Watts case. But since I researched the video I did a few weeks ago on the psychology of familicide, I've been looking at a, a wide range of family annihilator stories. And I came upon John List. And I want to tell his story on this channel. So sit down, enjoy the scenery, and just listen. So who was John List? He was born in 1925 in Michigan to German-American parents, John and Alma List. He was unremarkable. He grew up and he served for a couple of years from 1943 in the US Army during World War II. He was a lab technician. After the war ended, he went to university. He got a bachelor's degree in business and a master's degree in accounting. Again, still unremarkable. And then the Korean War, he was kind of re-enlisted and he served throughout the 1950s in the Korean War. And this is where he met his wife, Helen. And they got married, the war ended, and he worked his way up through a series of jobs. Helen bore him three children, Patricia, John, and Frederick. She had a child, Brenda, from a previous marriage. She was married before, but she was widowed. Her first husband died um, in action in the Korean War. So the kids were born in Kalamazoo, but as I said, he worked his way up through a series of jobs. He lived in New York for a while, or New York State for a while. And then they settled in New Jersey, in Westfield. John bagged a brilliant job. He became a vice president controller of a bank in New Jersey. And it saw the family really going up in the world. And they moved to this beautiful mansion called Breeze Knoll. And it was by far the most expensive property in the area. It had 19 rooms, including a ballroom. And the ballroom, the ceiling had a skylight, which was, it became known much, much later. It was a Tiffany & Co original worth $100,000, which was a heck of a lot of money. The trouble started in 1971. You see, in 1971, the bank closed and John lost his job, but he couldn't stand the thought of, telling this to his family because he was doing so well. You know, they were living in Breeze Knoll. Patricia, John and Frederick were growing up, doing well at school. Patricia wanted to be an actress. And his mother, Alma, who was in her 80s by this time, lived in an apartment in the attic. It was like a, a self-sufficient apartment. We call them granny flats in the UK, but I don't know whether that's an appropriate term for a property that um, served them so well and was so beautiful. So instead of telling his family that he'd lost his job, instead of trying to get another job, he just started to live a lie, a huge lie. And he was going out each day to work, but there was no work. And he was actually going and sitting for hours and hours on end in the train station in Westfield, where he'd, he'd read the news, he'd nap. You no one noticed him. He was so unremarkable, I guess, but no one noticed him. And he was able to do this and uh, pay the mortgage, pay the bills, 
by stealing money out of his mother's bank account. She was none the wiser. So then the fateful day happened. So this was the 9th of November, 1971, when he put his evil plan into action. It wasn't a crime of passion. It wasn't the act of a desperate man. Well, I guess it was, but it was a carefully and meticulously planned act of a desperate man. So, first of all, he, uh, he had two handguns. So on the early morning of the 9th of November, 1971, he went out to his car and quietly loaded his guns. Then he went back in the house and he shot his wife, Helen, in the back of the head, just shot her dead. And when I say it was meticulously planned, I really mean it because he'd been going to a shooting range to practice his shooting. So Helen was just shot dead. Helen herself was an alcoholic. She had syphilis, which she caught from her first husband. So I'm not sure how much kind of Helen's medical problems fed into John's reasoning behind what he did. I would argue it was much, much deeper than problems with his wife. So then he went upstairs to his mother's apartment. She was, you know, posturing about, preparing breakfast. And he shot her through the left eye and just left her on the floor to die. So then he potted around the house, did his thing, had some lunch, just as if nothing had happened. He cleaned up Helen's blood and he carefully laid her body out on a sleeping bag in the ballroom, the beautiful ballroom. He didn't take his mother downstairs, apparently she was too heavy, so he left her, her, he left her body up there in the, uh, in the attic apartment. So then there was the three children. So Patricia was the eldest, she was 16 at the time, she was at high school. She was doing well, as I said, she wanted to be an actress, but John didn't like that idea. He thought that actors were kind of um, taken over by Satan. You see, the thing is, he was a deeply, deeply religious man. He'd grown up in the Lutheran church, um, very strict moral code. He was heavily involved in the church. He always had been. His mother was as well, and all the family were involved in the church. So he didn't agree with Patricia wanted to become an actress. How much that factored in, his religiosity and his, um, his concern about his family. And I think it did. I think it did, as we'll see later. Patricia rang him as she wasn't feeling well. So she wanted him to pick her up from school a little bit early, which he did. And uh, she walked into the house and he shot her one shot to the back of the head, shot her dead exactly like he did with Helen. So then he had John and Frederick. So Frederick came home from school as normal. John knew what time he was gonna be home from school. So Frederick arrived and he shot him, shot him in the head and killed him. Then there was just John. Allegedly John was his favorite child. And um, the, the stories are conflicting here. One story is that John calmly went to John's school to watch him play a soccer game. Other stories suggest that John came home himself. But whichever is true, John arrived home and John was the one who fought back. He wasn't taken by surprise like the others had been. He fought back. And it ended up with John being peppered with bullets as he was fighting his father. And as he lay twitching on the ground, John was just peppering him with bullets. You know, he just emptied the barrel. So about shot, 10 shots um, before John eventually died. After which time, John carefully and meticulously cleaned up the scene with bleach, scrubbed all the floors where the bodies had lay, and he laid them all out in the ballroom on sleeping bags except for Alma the mother because 
she was too heavy to carry. And there they lay. So John had his dinner, had a sleep, and the next morning, John turned down the thermostat in the house, so it would be cold, and he tuned the radio to a religious station, and he piped it throughout the house on the intercom system. And there they lay for almost a month. John had, um, he got a plan, so he drove his car to JFK Airport in New York and left his car at the airport. So it was kind of like a ruse that the police would think that he'd taken a flight, but he didn't, he didn't take a flight. He got his way back to New Jersey and then got on the train via, I think he went via Michigan where he grew up. And then he went to Denver, Colorado, and he settled there. He settled there, um, joined the church Lutheran church there and eventually remarried someone called Dolores Miller and he lived just a perfectly normal unremarkable life called himself Robert Peter Clark or Bob so Bob and Dolores lived in Denver for many years meanwhile taking us back to that horrible scene so on the 7th of December 1971. One of Patricia's teachers was concerned about where she was. But it this was this was 29 days later after the murders. The bodies were laying there in the ballroom and in the attic, lying there decomposing. John had thought everything through. You know, one might wonder, you know, years later, if Chris Watts had been so meticulous as John was, whether he, had, you know, he would have got away with it. One can only speculate on that. But you see, John, what he'd done, he'd cancelled the post, he closed his bank account, his mother's bank account, he'd taken all the money out, um, and he'd left notes. He'd sent a letter to the school to say that the kids wouldn't be going there anymore because they had to go and tend an ailing relative in North Carolina. I think, I think he said it was Helen's mother, but don't quote me on that. But they were going caring for a sick relative and they wouldn't be going to school for the foreseeable future. So he did everything he could to give himself time to get away. So when I say this was meticulously premeditated, it absolutely was. He'd crossed the I's and dotted the T's, which was an example of how John had done so well in his career. You know, he'd gone into accounting and he was just meticulous, but people didn't like him. He was cold, he was distant. He didn't have very good social skills. So it was his, meticulous kind of way of working that got him the good jobs but once he was in those jobs you know just people just didn't get on with him but I don't think he cared honestly so the bodies were found because one of Patricia's teachers became suspicious the neighbors were already suspicious because John had left the lights on in the house to make it look like people were around but the bulbs started to blow so one by one, these lights went out. The neighbors just thought it was strange. So one night they saw someone snooping around the house. It was actually one of Patricia's teachers who'd gone there just to, just to see what was going on at the house. So the police were called and they discovered the scene. Heavily decomposing bodies. You can only imagine the smell of this and this eerie music playing throughout the house which was now almost in darkness because a lot of the bulbs had blown so a murder hunt ensued a murder hunt that was nationwide but they couldn't find him they could not find him so this case was kind of kept open but a cold case for 18 years, 18 years. So it was in 1989 
the the TV show America's Most Wanted. I watch that show still. Did a piece on him, and they didn't have many pictures because this was another thing that John did. He cut his face out of all the family photographs in the house. He left the photographs there, but he cut his face out. So the police didn't have much to go on. This is why he was able to just slip into slip into the darkness, so to speak, for 18 years, remarry. He had a series of jobs. He'd worked his way up again in various posts. And he was just the normal, unremarkable Bob Clark. And he didn't tell anyone about the murders that he'd committed those years before. Anyway, America's Most Wanted aired. This forensic artist called Frank Bender made a bust out of clay. And it was like an age progressed image of John. You know, these days they do, they do this using computer technology, but they didn't have that in 1989. So this was cleverly created what John would look like now. So based on the little information that Frank Bender was given, he was able to produce an age progressed image that was eerily accurate. And it is reported that John actually had watched this show and he was sweating, sweating his britches off when he saw the image because it was so much like him, but his wife didn't twig. He'd spent many years in Denver but then he moved to Virginia. But when this show aired, one of his neighbours that he'd had in Denver recognised him and called the police, called the show. And it only took them two weeks after this to find him. So they turned up at his home and uh, initially he said, no, I don't know John List. I'm not John List. But they knew very well he was because 18 years before they'd taken fingerprints. They'd done all the forensic testing that they were able to do back in 1971. And the fingerprints caught him because he could change his name. He could move thousands of miles away. He could, he could keep, you know, keep, keep ahead of the police. He just, you know, just, just melded into the community, the church community in Denver and then in Virginia. So yeah, the fingerprints, the forensics caught him. So it didn't matter that 18 years had passed. But anyway, he was arrested. He was charged with five counts of first degree murder. He pled not guilty um, on grounds of diminished responsibility, but a jury found him guilty on all charges. So he went to prison eventually after 18 years. And he was in his 60s then. He died in prison. He actually died in hospital. He, he caught pneumonia at the age of 82. And he died in hospital. But as a, as a prisoner. So there you go. That's the story of John List. Horrific. I find it horrific but fascinating that somebody was able to carefully plan and get away with it for so long and it was only the forensic artist Frank Bender when he produced that image that just by chance someone recognised and because the police had that little bit of forensic evidence that, that fingerprint you know John hadn't thought of that had he you know if he'd have if he'd have worn gloves throughout the entire killings, maybe it would have been a little bit harder to pin something on him. I don't know, I don't know, but they caught him anyway. And the jury found him rightfully guilty. So there's the story of John List, or Bob Clark. As I said, I found it totally fascinating that somebody was just an unremarkable man was able to just calmly and carefully plot the demise of his entire family. So why did he do it? Well, this is the question. Because what he'd done before he left 
this would have been on the 10th of November 1971, he wrote a letter to his pastor, a confession letter. And he said in this letter that he did it so that his family would go to heaven because he felt that if he'd have come clean and told the truth, they would have had to go on welfare. They'd have had to change their lives completely. And the shock of this change of lifestyle would turn them away from God and away from the Lutheran church. He believed his daughter Patricia had already turned away because she wanted to be an actress. And his wife, Helen, because of her illness and her alcoholism, he also felt she'd turned away from the church as well. So he did them a favour. The shades of Laurie Vallow, for me, in this story. So he believed that they go to heaven. And he didn't want to commit, commit him, his, his own demise because he felt that taking his own life would, um, would bar him from heaven. This was his story. You might believe that, you might not. You might just think this is the act of a selfish man who just wanted to rid himself of his life and his debts and, um, and, and just, just go and be someone else for the rest of his life. And it so very nearly worked. Very nearly worked. There's a twist in the tale that is really ironic. A few months after the bodies were retrieved from Breeze Knoll, there was an arson attack on it and the house burned down or it was severely damaged. And when the firefighters went in, they found this glass ceiling, this glass skylight in the ballroom. And it was, uh, it was damaged, but if it hadn't have been, if John had just taken that skylight and sold it, he would have had in his pocket $100,000. I don't know what that would have been worth in 1971. $100,000 is a lot these days, but back then it was a tidy packet that would have paid off all of his debts and would have given his family a new start. But he chose the other way. In prison, he was diagnosed with obsessive compulsive personality disorder. That was his diagnosis. So he was mentally ill, mentally impaired, but he was so rigid in his thinking, so blinded by his own, I don't know, his own, his own belief system that is told time and time again in family annihilation stories that they believe that they've got to do it. And they do it. But this one, this one's remarkable, an unremarkable man doing something remarkably horrific and almost getting away with it. So guys, I hope you enjoyed my walk. And uh, I like doing these videos outside, you know, this, this time of year, it's beautiful. I think there was a little bit of wind noise, so hopefully that wasn't too distracting. So let me know what you think about the John List story. Give this video a like share it if you can and that will show me that you know my audience wants more of this kind of content so i'll speak to you very soon i've been michelle i hope you're well i'll see you in the next video bye folks <laughs>